I, I have a sneaking suspicion you're not going to agree on net zero. Um, Ed, uh, this is something that a lot of uh, political parties are talking about. Uh, it was in the manifestos of a lot of the main political parties. I mean, what do you think should happen on the climate uh, in the election that's coming up? Because we seem to be talking so much about uh, the internal machinations of the Conservative Party and so on. But to a lot of people, this is a major concern. You're absolutely right. And I think actually talking about the major parties talking a lot about net zero, I don't think they're talking about it enough at all. I mean, look, we're the climate party, but it's really the climate opportunity party. It's all about this enormous opportunity that's coming from net zero in the future for our clean industries in this country. We've got now 92% of world GDP under some sort of net zero commitment. Now, however serious they are, what the dates they've taken and targets is sort of irrelevant. The direction of travel globally is absolutely assured. They're all going that way at some period of time. Now, we need to get ahead, grab this new clean industrial revolution and make it work for Britain. And just one thing to think about, Historically, what have we been doing? In the 1970s, we had nearly 30% of our GDP came from manufacturing and industry. It's dropped off now to under 10%. We hardly make anything anymore in this country. At the same time, we've been running a trade balance that's against us, that's negative. We're exporting a lot less than we're importing. Now, if you did that at home or if a company did that, that means racking up debt that eventually makes you bankrupt. And we have been racking up debt. Eight billion a month we're paying on our interest payments at the moment. How do we solve it? We massively invest. Not the pitiful things being talked about by Labour and the Conservatives, but huge investment. And what do we invest in? Tomorrow's technologies, tomorrow's industries. And what are those industries? The net zero train is going to happen. You don't have to believe in climate change or not. It doesn't really matter. It is coming down the track and we need to be at the front leading it and making money out of it for British industry and British people and growing, growing our manufacturing base, our clean manufacturing base and then exporting to the rest of the world. If not, we leave it to China and America and we're going to be paying them for the next two decades. Rolf, what do you think of what uh, Ed has just said there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, lots of good points, but I think the argument just because the entire world is planning to go over a cliff doesn't mean that the UK should join them. So just over because, a cliff? Yeah, yeah, because just everybody does something. It's not a need that you should join them. The Germans have run the experiment for the last 20 years. They are deindustrializing, their economy is shrinking. So for them, the energy transition was never what was promised. So I hear this, don't get me wrong, I hear this all the time, the, the economy of the future, the opportunities of the future, but we don't have a single example where they have materialized. The United States are not a good example. The US economy currently runs on natural gas. They switched from coal to gas, but they, don't, they did not switch to renewables or the greens. Uh, and China is again missing their uh, climate goals. So does India, so does South Africa. So these promises, these pledges, are made for PR reasons, but pretty much every country misses them because they know at this moment when technology changes, I'm all open for the conversation, but current technology will not allow Britain to become a manufacturing superpower based on wind, solar, theothermal, or any of these kinds. It is, it's, it's simply the technology is currently not there and we don't have an example where it happened, unless you can name a country where it did happen. I think there's a mixture of two different things there. The altruistic opportunity to get to net zero to save the world, which I think you mix up with the commercial opportunity to make a shed load of money and actually have jobs and money and prosperity in the what UK. Did happen. One second. I think the, the this idea of going off the cliff, it's not going off the cliff. This is the way the economies are going at the moment. And there are many, many, many commercial examples of where money is being made or where money will be hugely made in the future. And it's rather obvious. And let's just take steel manufacturing as one example so we can focus in on something concrete. In the UK at the moment, at Port Talbot, we are getting rid of 3,000 jobs. We're losing them. We're putting in effectively a recycling plant now for our, for our steel. It's not going to be a plant that makes new virgin steel. And at the same time, over in Sweden at the moment, for literally the same cash amount of money, they're putting in H2 steel. So a brand new steel virgin steel manufacturing plant with 95% decarbonised steel that when it goes online in two years time we'll make the same amount of steel roughly as Port Talbot does and within five years we'll double it and even reduce the carbon down to 97.5% decarbonised which is what Europe wants. That is so obviously a commercial opportunity it wasn't going to cost us any more than what we're doing now to put in our recycling plant and we would actually be ahead of the curve and starting to take orders from the rest of, the Euro of Europe and elsewhere in the world for the clean steel that everybody is going to want. If we keep going, if we keep thinking about the fact it can't be done, it can't. We have to grip it, get that mission, get that vision and go for it. And we know the world is going there. However, they have gone up and down in their, their targets to get there now and we need to be supplying them.
Well, well, again, I, I like what you're saying, but the point, of course it's a commercial opportunity, especially for those who know that government money will flow into it. But the idea of green steel, very simply said, uh, the idea it's going to be cheaper, for example, than coal is simply not true. Like You cannot split the baby. So if the argument is we have to make, for example, green steel, because it's, for, it's for the environment. I'm all happy with the argument. But to say it's also going to be cheaper simply is not true. And the main steel producers know this. Look at China, look at India, look at all these other places. You must understand, like um, hydrogen, for example, is not an energy source. It's an energy carrier. So if you run a steel plant on hydrogen, you first need energy to produce that hydrogen. Half of it gets lost when you bring it then to the, to the steel plant. And so the price will go up. And my people are saying, oh, well, steel is a little bit more expensive. But if steel is more expensive, your car is going to be, going to be more expensive. And whose car are you going to buy? The expensive British one or the cheap one from China who makes steel, but they use coal to make steel? Uh, I mean, it's absolutely very clear, though, with every single industry, as you scale it, prices come down. Now, look, at the, at the time it's coming out, it's going to come in at roughly, I think, 30% more expensive than current steel today. What's it going to be in a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, as the world starts going there, the technology improves? And there's a big issue here. Britain is currently behind the rest of the world. But if we go for this massive investment, if we bring forward our targets and actually lead it, we will be doing all the innovations that the rest of the world needs. And you're talking about the cost price at only 30%. In the war, in terms of innovation, we had ships prior to the war, we were building in 250 days roughly. And in the middle of the war, we were building them roughly in 40 days and we built one of them in four and a half, five to 60 times faster. And that was done only a few years later on. When you actually get at it and you go for it, you invest and you're determined and you believe government, has credibility in terms of targets, you can get there. Quick word from Ralph, and then I want to take a call. No, I'm just saying, I mean, this is, we constantly announce innovations that will come down the road. And as I always say, for me, this is like saying I jump out of a plane without a parachute because I say, I'm going to invent a parachute on my way down. And this is what the argument that is currently made. No, you say, I, think, I think it's completely different. Planes on the way down, you've got a parachute and you're refusing to jump out. No, but I don't think so. Because even if we do what you are now saying, I mean, the global climate will not be saved if the British steel industry switches to hydrogen. That's We're not talking about saving that. it. We're talking about making money for Britain. Let's see what Stephen Northampton has to say from this. He's given me a call on 0344 499 1000. Steve, you're very welcome to the programme. Good morning to you. Uh, you're on with me and also with Ralph and Ed. What would you like to say? Good morning, Peter. Good morning. Yes, I would like to say about personal costs to the householder with this green initiative to change the, uh, the, the, the from electric, from, sorry, gas, to uh, the air source heat pumps. Yes, because heat, heat pumps are a big thing that we're all being, we're all being told... Uh, uh, to, to change to them or lots of people, lots of financial incentives and so on. What do, what do you make of this, Steve? Absolutely nonsense. It will cost me uh, or my family in the region of £70,000 as pounds. How, how do you calculate that, convert. Steve? That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. We've got to dig up the floors where the pipework runs. OK, and, and uh, buy the heat uh, pump sorry. itself and, and other things, yeah? Yeah, you've got to dig up the... So you've got to replace all the floor coverings. Mm -hmm. We have to improve the insulation to the outside of our 1920s house. So uh, lot... Internally or externally. Yeah. So lots of... We lot... have got to uh, install new radiators. The pipe work has got to be a lot larger. The radiators have got to be a lot bigger. The costs for all of this add up to me. I, I was a chartered civil engineer. This costing is in the region of 70,000. If you live in a, a terraced house in the middle of uh, one of the estates in Northampton uh, that was built around the turn of the last century, the previous century, yeah. it will probably cost the householder or the landlord 30 plus thousand and, and also the convert that house and the big question achieve, steve yeah sorry uh, the big question of course is where the money comes from but also with a heat pump where do you put it i mean steve raises ed a number of questions there about the personal costs of this and uh, people sometimes feel i don't know how steve feels but some people sometimes feel a bit lectured by this and you know buy this thirty thousand pound electric car uh, buy this a twenty thousand pound heat pump and so on. Um, this is just not economical, at least at the moment, Ed. 
I think the, the idea of £70,000 to upgrade your home, of course, is vast. I mean, I haven't heard a story like that before, and it's quite, you know, it's a relatively extreme one, I would have thought. Um, and it's clearly not going to work for everybody tomorrow. So let's not kid ourselves that every single person can put in a heat pump tomorrow and it works for them perfectly. Um, take the more basic house, um, you know, you have to make sure it's insulated properly, um, which we should be doing anyway, whatever kind of format we're using in terms of the heating. Um, there are, of course, heat pump deals which go down to remarkably low levels now with the government subsidy of the 7,500. Octopus talking about 500 quid now to put in your heat pump as well. So. His situation is very specific, and I clearly can't comment about that, and I'm not an expert on heat pumps. But now, the way that we've got the, uh, the government subsidies running, you can get it done fairly cheaply. I do want to take slight issue, actually, with the, the impression given by the 30,000 electric car, actually, because that, that gives the impression that it's beyond the reach of absolutely everybody and all that sort of thing. Now, beyond not, the reach of a lot of people. Well, hang on. I, I think, look, I, I went out, I bought a second-hand car, second-hand electric car, Nissan Leaf, £5,000. I will get the entire amount of that £5,000 back in three years on how cheap it is to run for me, both on the repairs, the tax, and the electricity usage for the mileage. So actually, it pays for itself after three years. Now, Miss Lee, you've got to have £5,000 at the beginning to pay for it. Sure. But once you actually pay for it, that for a car, it yeah. it's utterly the cheapest way to do it. Ralph, what's your reaction to what Ed has been saying and also what Steve has been telling us from Northampton? Well, I think it's just a quick example. I mean, the, the headquarters of the Green Party in Germany in Berlin, they have been trying to install a heat pump now for three years and it cost them over five million euros because <laughs> uh, you can't you can't do it everywhere. I mean, it's not easy. And there's another thing we really have to address. In Britain, in Europe, the grid is not there. The transformers are not there. So the idea of electrifying everything from cars to, to, uh, you know, to households to heating, we don't have the necessary infrastructure. And as long as this is not addressed, it's not going to happen. This is not the laws of politics, it's the laws of physics you're running up against. So to say you're net zero in 10 years, I mean, I mean it's, it's physically impossible. Is that just too ambitious, Ed? Uh, certainly not too ambitious when you look at what can be done when you put your mind to it. We gave the example of you know shipbuilding during World War II. We've got the example of vaccines as well, etc. Whether we agree with them or not, it's completely irrelevant, but the speed in which they were created and brought to market. So once you put the money in, once you put in government procurement, the direction of legislation, everything else, it happens extremely fast, so long as government is credible. So no, I don't believe that 10 years from now would be impossible. I believe it's absolutely possible. And I believe commercially, if we want to beat the rest of the world and then end up with this massive export opportunity that's coming, we need to get there in that kind of time frame. If not, we're going to miss the boat. We're going to pay China and America for everything. How uh, far does your Nissan Leaf go on one charge? Uh, it goes... I suppose to answer it in a typical politician the right way around, for my purposes of running around to what I'm doing and then getting towards train stations and tube stations to come here, I only have to charge it every three to four days. It only does 80 miles, though. It only 80 miles, right? Yeah, sure. see, a lot so of, not, a lot of so I don't want to kid anybody that no, you no, can no, suddenly do it. No, no, a lot of people will be put off by that.